In 1999, B&M perfected the Hypercoaster. It had been around for years prior. Arrow, Morgan, and Togo all took their crack at it, and they did a decent job. But B&M just waited and watched. And when they released Apollo's Chariot and Raging Bull in 1999, it was all over. Intamin came out with their Hyper model the same year, and that's been a little more hit and miss. I've already ranked my favorite B&M Hypers. That link is below if you want to see it. And people were asking, how about you rank Hypers from other manufacturers? So let's throw out B&M, those darn overachievers. And let's bring in every coaster between 200 and 299 feet to play this game, regardless if it's a true Hyper or not. After a quick Excel filter, I ended up with 20 coasters that I've ridden that fit the bill. Perfect. These are my top 20 Hypers, if B&M never existed. Number 20, Manhattan Express at the New York, New York Hotel and Casino. The worst coaster I've ever ridden that stands over 200 feet is no surprise. It's a Togo, and its drop comes nowhere near 200 feet. And that's probably a good thing, considering how janky the track work is. You don't want this thing going faster than it does. Now, it did get new trains this year, and I haven't gotten a chance to ride it, since the wind shut it down the last time I was there. So maybe it'll move up, but probably not. Number 19, Son of Beast at Kings Island. I give Paramount an A for effort in wanting a looping woody over 200 feet and with over 7,000 feet of track. It sounds like a maintenance nightmare, but they went for it. I give them an F for hiring RCCA when CCI and GCI were right there, and they could have done it, assuming they'd accept the project. What we got was a rough, boring, and pointless woody, and it had massive structural defects, and this thing didn't even last 10 years. Number 18, Goliath at Six Flags Magic Mountain. It may have opened as the world's tallest coaster in 2000, and it has an impressive 255 foot drop. It may be smooth and intense, but this has so many boring elements, and it throws away all that heightened speed on the weakest elements that Giovanola could have dreamt up. I curse Six Flags for not going with B&M for Magic Mountain's Hyper. I would have loved a good 200 footer with airtime, but instead we got the record breaker, and it does nothing. Number 17, Titan at Six Flags over Texas. Same story as Goliath, and a near clone. It's a little taller, its tunnel is a little more shallow, but its biggest difference is that helix before the mid-course. Goliath just turns into it, and Titan will crush your bones into it. It's one of the more intense elements I've ever experienced, and I respect it, so it gets the edge over Goliath. Number 16, Desperado at Buffalo Bills Resort and Casino. I imagine the hype over this coaster was huge, opening on the California-Nevada border back in 1994. I don't know if there was coaster hype back then, but I like to think there was. I don't know, I was six years old when it opened. And despite its stupid layout wrapping around the hotel, its bizarre angles and track profiling, not to mention the roughness, I do try to enjoy it after forking over 14 bucks to ride it, but I genuinely enjoy the speed and decent airtime, as well as the long ride time. Don't pass up Desperado if you're crossing the California-Nevada border. It's right there off Interstate 15, so if you actually see it open, make sure you do it. It's become a rare credit. Number 15, Wicked Twister at Cedar Point. When you're asked to name the six coasters at the park that clear 200 feet, this is the one you forget about, I guarantee it. This came near the end of the intimate impulse craze, and this was the biggest and best one, with the spike standing at 215 feet. And unlike the other ones, this one has a twisted rear spike. This may be one of the lesser popular coasters at Cedar Point, but don't sleep on that back spike in the back row. Getting yanked all the way up that spike backward is something that you won't find anywhere else. Number 14, speed the ride at the NASCAR Cafe at the Sahara. For a long time, this was the least janky coaster in the Vegas area, and it only closed because of the hotel's financial problems. Nobody could find this poor Premier Rides coaster a home, and it's been sitting near the strip for 10 years. And it's a shame, since it was a lot of fun, and I used to marathon it. It qualifies for this list because of that 224-foot vertical spike, and that marked the midpoint of the ride, as the train would rise up and then fall back to do the course backwards. Number 13, Steel Force at Dorney Park. I'm about to pick up a couple more Morgan Hyper credits, Mamba and Wild Thing. But if they're anything like Steel Force, I won't get too excited. It's got height, speed, and length on its side. As for airtime, you know, for having that many airtime hills, you'd think you'd have a little more airtime. It's weak to non-existent. That being said, it's still my top ride at Dorney Park. So take that as you will. Number 12, Skyrush at Hershey Park. For those of you who think I hate Skyrush, just look at all the coasters that I rank lower. Skyrush has a few redeeming qualities that makes it a coaster in the top 25% of all my credits. Good drop, great ejector hill, good cutback. 
That's pretty much it. Throw in a lot of filler track and a painful lap bar, and you have a halfway decent hyper that could be so much better. Why can't Skyrush use the same lap bar as Velocicoaster? That's what I want to know. Maybe one day. Number 11. Superman Ride of Steel at Six Flags America. Intamin's first crack at the hyper model turned out to be... funky. This is a mirror clone of the original, with some good airtime moments, and random massive helices, and straight track. It's a pretty average hyper, and this one loses points for having metal bars on the side of the lap bar, and that was specifically designed to break stuff in your pockets. I mean, there's no other explanation for it. Number 10 and number 9. Mr. Freeze Reverse Blast at Six Flags St. Louis and over Texas. These premier rides launch shuttle coasters have it all. Powerful launch, intensity, unique elements, and a 218-foot spike that has boosters on it, and that lifts you up even higher, and then you freefall face first to the ground to do the whole course forward. I've ridden both, and they're the same to me, other than St. Louis having a cooler secluded setting. Number 8. Ride of Steel at Six Flags Darien Lake. Here's the original, and you can tell because that straight track takes place over the water. Oh, so that's why it's there. Anyway, the original Ride of Steel is smoother than the one at Six Flags America, and its T-bars don't have that extra metal bar on the side, so this one gets the edge. Number 7. Accelerator at Knott's Berry Farm. Hard to believe Knott's has a 200-foot coaster, but the peak of that top hat stands 205 feet, so it qualifies for this list. As great as the airtime coming over the top hat is, I love the ridiculous 0 to 82 mile per hour launch the most. I could marathon this coaster just for that. Accelerator is an important coaster in history. This is the one that introduced the hydraulic launch, but it also stands up as a great ride 19 years after it opened. Number 6. Phantom's Revenge at Kennywood. I'll always love this coaster for being my 300th credit, and I appreciate it living up to the hype. Everyone said it's a smooth speed machine with mental airtime, and they were absolutely right. Morgan did an amazing job converting this aero looper into a more traditional hypercoaster, and this had no hint of roughness left over when they were done. Number 5. Cannibal at Lagoon. Who would have thought to make a 208 foot drop and then slap a 116 degree angle on it? Only the demented minds of Lagoon. Yes, the park built this crazy thing themselves. From the elevator lift in the tower, to that insane drop, to its four, maybe five, wacky inversions, and then its Helix finale. I don't know anyone who doesn't love Cannibal, and it's been around my top 20 ever since I first wrote it in 2017. Number four, Magnum XL200 at Cedar Point. How is this 32-year-old hyper still rising in my rankings? Unlike Desperado, this has a strong layout and good maintenance. My rides in 2018 were better than those in 2016, and my ride in 2020 was the best ride that I got at any coaster the whole day. The finale is epic, everyone knows that, but some people think this ride is only about the finale. I was getting solid airtime all over the course, from the first drop all the way to the turn into the finale, and that really rounded out the ride experience. I hope Cedar Point never feels the need to replace Magnum. It's my number two ride in the park. Number three, Superman the Ride at Six Flags New England. My number one layout in America has to be high on this list, despite the U-brick lap bars killing a lot of the airtime. I still love the view of the Connecticut River when going up the lift, and then having the perfect combination of big camelbacks in the first half, and the spaghetti bowl in the second half. I love airtime, but rides that focus 100% on airtime usually aren't my favorite. I like a coaster to mix it up a little. Superman the Ride does this perfectly. With the original T-bar lap bars, this would probably be in my overall top five. Number two, X2 at Six Flags Magic Mountain. This is what I call the X factor when comparing Six Flags parks. Great Adventure and Great America are, well, great, but they don't have a ride like X2. Nobody does, outside of Japan and China. You won't find another ride in America that drops you over 200 feet face first to the ground, flips you on your back, and then does acrobatic maneuvers while your seats are rotating on their axis. It's not the smoothest ride, but it all adds to the chaos. It's not super rewritable, but that's not because of the roughness. That's because of the intensity. A ride this crazy, on that scale, it's hard to believe it exists. And to think, Aishinaika is 75 feet taller. Number one, Steel Vengeance at Cedar Point. When we learned that RMC was coming to Cedar Point and they started stacking wood on top of Bean Streak's lift hill, we knew they were going for that 200 foot mark. This was built to be the world's best coaster and I think they did it. It's really a flawless ride, starting with that 200 foot vertical drop all the way to the Bunny Hill finale, offering up over a mile of track, record setting airtime, and it never loses steam the whole time. You have to respect what RMC did with Steel Vengeance, and that's why it's my number one and it's not exactly close. So there you have it, my non b 200 footers ranked up. I'm a huge b and hyper fanboy, as you can tell from my top 50 and my video ranking them up. The link is down below if you want to see that. But I wanted to highlight the way the other manufacturers crossed the 200 foot mark, and that's why I made this video. 
Let me know which hypers or 200 foot coasters are your favorite, B&M or not, and what you think of my list. If I was too harsh or too nice to anything on here, sound off in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to drop a like. That's the best way to show your support for the channel. And if you love coasters and ranking things up, be sure to sub and hit the bell for more content just like this. Also check out my links below for my Discord server, where you can chat with other fans of the channel, as well as my second channel, where I post copyright-free off-ride footage. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you all next time.